Hello, cybersecurity law class. This is Professor Opterbeck. I thought I would just uh, drop a little video to touch base on our progress as we uh, move closer toward our final summit meeting and toward the end of the semester. So this week we are addressing an issue that's a really difficult issue to address, which, address, which is online child exploitation. And I do want to sort of apologize that some of the material that we have to read and look at is, is um, you know, really disturbing and difficult to read and look at, but this is really a serious problem and it is something that um, we need to deal with in the law and, and uh, in this course. Um, so there's a lot of Supreme Court case law to look at. You'll see that it's, it's been really difficult for Congress to uh, come up with legislation that is designed to protect children online. Now, it's, it's of course not difficult to have legislation that says um, child pornography materials are unlawful to possess, to distribute, um, to obtain, and so on. And that's, that's clear in federal law and in state law, and that's not the issue. But the issue is other kinds of measures designed to segregate certain sorts of content from children on the one hand, and then measures that are designed to um, restrict the distribution and production and use of uh, what is called virtual child pornography. So that is either adults that are um, portraying themselves to be children um, or that is uh, digitally manipulated content involving real children who are doing innocent things but are made to look to be doing um, terrible things or content that is entirely digitally generated. So you'll see the difficulty under the First Amendment in uh, some of that case law. Um, I also, in the discussion form, I'm giving you kind of a, uh, it's not a repeat, but it builds on the question we did in our, our human rights module about um, platforms being required to restrict access to violent or terrorist content. And now we're gonna focus on um, a specific part of US law, the Communications Decency Act, and whether uh, it should be amended to, to make platforms in some way liable or culpable for not policing the availability of online, online child exploitation materials. And you'll, you'll see part of the concern when you read the New York Times articles that I uh, linked for you today, you'll see why some law lawmakers are calling on platforms, app developers, and so on to have some culpability. But I think if you, you, know, you read through the, the law, you'll see and think about it a little bit, you'll, you'll see why there's some pushback from cyber civil liberties groups about, you know, to what extent, if any, the platform should should be um, legally responsible. I'll just give you one little uh, kind of personal story along these lines. Years ago, um, at my old law firm, I represented America Online in New Jersey when America Online was sort of one of the major internet providers. Um, and so they would have billing disputes, other sorts of things that I, I just sort of landed being the person to, to handle at the, at the firm. And it was, a, it was an interesting client to, to work with. But I had one case where a guy brought a billing dispute, uh, and he, he brought the case pro se. He was, uh, as, he was a little bit crazy. Um, but he also claimed in the pleading that AOL should be um, subject to an injunction to police itself to prevent access to child pornography. And he actually attached to the complaint um, a bunch of child pornography images, which in a, in a pretty rare move, I got the court to actually strike from the record because of course those things are contraband and, and unlawful and you have to wonder um, why this guy had access to these materials at all. Um, so I moved to dismiss that part of the pleading based on the Communications Decency Act. Um, and I was certainly legally right um, in, in making that motion and ultimately um, did get the case dismissed on that, on that ground. Um, meanwhile, the guy, I, I don't think it exists anymore, but the guy had actually created a website um, posting all of my pleadings and, and uh, uh, criticizing me and, and so on, which, is, which was actually a little bit um, amusing kind of part, of part of the case. But it just illustrates that, that internet companies viewed and still view the CDA um, as an important tool against claims by people like this particular plaintiff who wanted to say it's the, it's the platform's fault. Um, and on the other hand, of course, we do see now, and, and maybe it has some merit, 
arguments that the platforms can't sort of just wash their hands of all this um, anymore. Even then, when I was handling those cases in, um, you know, kind of around 2000 or so, um, when AOL was a was sort of still a major concern, it, it, it even then it didn't have the the reach uh, and accessibility of today's social media platforms or, or chat apps and, and so on. So it's something uh, we're thinking about um, and um, I hope we have a, a robust discussion on it this week and I'll see you on the discussion board.